everybody here. Hope everybody's having a great Sunday morning. A little chilly this morning, but glad you all could thaw out and meet us here this morning. We're going to be in Luke chapter 16, uh, continuing our study in the Gospel of Luke. And last week, of course, we were in 15, which goes before 16, and we had a lesson on lost things. We saw the lost uh, sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And we saw how that was uh, these parables were ways in which Jesus was teaching people to not despise those who have been marginalized by society or those that we consider perhaps the, the offscouring of society or anything like that. Not to shun those, but to actually embrace them and bring them into the fold of God and to share with them the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. And so uh, we learned that last week. Now this week we're going to kind of be... Uh, looking at some ideas that kind of fall in that vein, but uh, more focused on the aspect of money. So we're going to be talking about money matters uh, this morning. And Jesus used a story to kind of bring this to life. And we're going to see some lessons, actually several lessons, that he uh, derives from this story that he gives. And it's typically called the parable of the unrighteous steward. And it says in verse 1, Now he was also saying to his disciples. Now this story could have been directed to his disciples. Uh, he's going to talk about money and being generous with money. Maybe this parable was directed to maybe some tax collectors that had come under his wing and become a part of his following to, to teach them, hey, the way that you did tax collecting and the way that you did business, uh, you might want to revise that now that you're following me. Or it could be that Jesus is directing this towards the religious leaders at the time who were very greedy and were all about acquiring wealth. And he's kind of uh, directing this towards them for the benefit of the disciples. So teaching the disciples, don't be like them. Either way, the principles apply to all and we'll be taking it from uh, looking at the principles that this story can give. But it continues on. It says, there was a rich man who had a manager... And this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. Now back in this day and age, uh, rich people, yeah, they might have had a large piece of property that they lived on, but they would also have a property in different areas. Uh, maybe a rich person who lived in Orange Grove might have a property outside of Robstown, 100 acres out there or something. And the way that they would make money off of it is they could rent it out to someone who could utilize that money to farm, farm the land, create some type of produce, and then require rent from them, quote unquote rent, not necessarily in money, but in uh, agricultural goods. So if you were growing wheat on the land, then you'd give them a portion of that wheat that you had produced, and then that's how the rich man would acquire money from the land, even though he himself wasn't working the land, and maybe not even living on the land that he was uh, acquiring these goods from. And this manager, or this steward, uh, is a person who was in charge of all this. So the rich man, he's got more important things to do, like, like eat and drink and have a good time. But the steward would be the one who would be over his financial, perhaps he was keeping the record books, he was the accountant, uh, he was making sure that everybody was paying the proper amount of goods that they were supposed to. Uh, this guy would basically be taking over all of the rich man's financial concerns. So he very weighty responsibility that he had. But the rich man had heard that this man had been squandering everything. Now, what is exactly meant by that? Uh, we don't know, but just the fact that he wasn't making good use of the goods that were being received uh, from uh, the debtors and from other places. So in verse 2 it says, And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management. For you can no longer be a manager. So in other words, he's going to get the pink slip. He's about to get fired. Uh, no longer will he be the manager. The rich man, uh, of course, isn't going to put up with someone squandering his goods. Uh, even though he probably had plenty to have squandered, he still didn't want that going on. Uh, understandably so. And so he's going to fire this manager. So in verse 3, the manager said to himself, what shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. So, 
anytime, of course, you're going to be facing unemployment, that's a fearful thing. And, and a lot of people in recent years have uh, perhaps experienced this. I'm losing my job, whether they're fired or laid off or whatever. Uh, that's a scary thing. And the very first thing you start thinking about is, what am I going to do to supplement this income? What am I going to do to actually make some money now that I'm losing my job? And he is you know, considering two thoughts or two possible routes that he could take. One would be to, uh, to dig. So I, I can't dig. Now, could he not dig because he was a white collar worker his whole life? Uh, and so he just wasn't physically able to go out and do the hard labor of digging? Or was it just the fact that he saw that so beneath him and he's like, I can't dig. That's not, you know, I, I'm not, I don't come from uh, a family of diggers. We, we don't do that. Um, most likely it might be because he felt he couldn't physically do it. Maybe he's up in age. Maybe he's an elderly, elderly person. Who knows? But he says, I can't dig, uh, dig so that's not an option. And he says, and I'm ashamed to beg. So, you know, he's been the wealthy guy. He's been the one that people looked up to. He's the one that uh, people had seen as prestigious and and influential and wealthy. And now to go out and actually bang on doors and ask for money or to hold his hand out, uh, it was too much of a shameful thing. He just couldn't bring himself to be able to do that. So what do you do in a situation like that? You can't go out and work and earn the money. Secondly, you, can, you feel like you can't go out and beg for the money. What other, what other way can a person get money? Well, there's a third option. And we'll see there was actually a fourth option he could do as well that he didn't consider. But the third option would be, okay, well, I, I'm too ashamed to go and beg for money. So if I can create a situation such as that allows people to voluntarily receive me and voluntarily give me what I need, then I'll be taken care of. I don't have to dig and I don't have to beg because people, I've made these friends and people are just voluntarily providing for me. So that's the option that he takes. And uh, in verse four, he says, and I know what I shall do so that when I'm removed from management, uh, from the management, people may welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors. And he began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So um, that could be anywhere between seven and 10 gallons of oil. That's a lot of oil, especially uh, uh, olive oil. Think about how many olives it would take to press out enough to make seven to ten gallons of oil. But anyways, that's how much he owed him. A uh, hundred measures of this oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. So he cuts the bill in half. Uh, you only owe fifty. In verse seven, then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat, which could have been between seven and fourteen uh, uh, bushels of wheat. Uh, there's some disagreement on exactly what that figure would be, but a pretty good portion of wheat. And he's, but it's 100 measures of wheat, and he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So it cuts his bill down. So what's he doing? He's making friends. He's saying, look, you know, I'm helping you out here, cutting down your bill. Uh, wink, wink, remember me uh, whenever I lose my job. He's trying to create friends, which is interesting because there was a fourth option he could have taken that's kind of connected to this, as mentioned earlier. He could have gone to the man who owned 100 measures of oil and said, sit down and write 120 measures. I said it wrong, actually you owe 120, gave his master the 100 and pocketed the 20 to keep later on while he didn't have a job to help you know, provide for himself. And the same thing with the guy who owed, owed the wheat. He could have uh, increased it to 120 measures of wheat and therefore pocketed the extra. That, by the way, that's what the tax collectors did. Uh, the Roman government would say to people, oh, this many taxes, and what they do is they would add to that, give the taxes to the Roman officials that belonged to them, and then they would pocket the extra. So they were, that's one reason why people despise tax collectors so much. And that would have been an option that this manager could have done. Increase the debt and the taking. But guess what that would have done? Yeah, he would have had a little bit of extra money that might have carried him for a few years, but he would have had a whole lot of enemies. And that would have, as soon as that money ran out, uh, he would be uh, down and out. So he takes the option of making friends. 
friendship for him was more valuable than the money. And that's, why, that's one of the reasons why he's so wise. And, and Jesus will address that here in a moment. And then in verse uh, 8, it says, And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. So that's interesting that the manager, here this guy's cutting down people's debt, which would have injured the, man, the, the master in one way, but he was so impressed that this guy was so wise and so shrewd in the way that he handled the situation that he was actually impressed, uh, thinking, that, wow, that was pretty smart. So Jesus uses this story of this man who squandered his master's money, who had... Um, and was about to lose his job and cuts down people's debt in order to make friends. Therefore, being praised by the master for acting shrewdly. He's going to use this story to give us some principles in connection to our relationship with others and our relationship with money. That's where he continues. He says, For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. All right, so the sons of this age or the, the sons of this generation, or you could say the sons of this world. In other words, people who are engaged in worldly activities, who are concerned with financial things, he says oftentimes they act more shrewdly than the sons of light, that is, the people uh, of God, the people who should be, um, or, or who are engaged in spiritual activities. He says sometimes they act more shrewdly than them. And how is that so? Well, have you ever known someone, maybe a, a a worldly person, maybe a, a Scrooge, like in the Christmas story, uh, a man who, who really is all about money, and he's all about it, uh, acquiring a lot of wealth, guess what? He acts very shrewdly in the way that he deals with his money. He's looking to the future, uh, he's making sure that he's investing it in stocks, and he's putting it where it will acquire some uh, interest, He's got a 401k. He's got all these different things, puts his money in many different places so that his money can acquire more money for himself. And he's very thoughtful, very meticulous about how he's going to uh, deal with this money that he has so that he can acquire more wealth. He said the people of the world are very shrewd oftentimes when it comes to this. And, and this uh, unrighteous manager is an example of that. But the sons of light oftentimes aren't that shrewd when it comes to spiritual things. Do we really put as much effort and time into the investment in the future, into the heavenly kingdom, as worldly people do in their earthly kingdom? Are we storing up treasures in heaven and being as diligent and as shrewd and as wise in storing up treasures in heaven as people are in storing up treasures here on this earth? Oftentimes, we aren't as keen and as uh, cognizant of and, and aware of where our investments are going as people of the world do. And so Jesus is saying that oftentimes, the, and by the way, this story is a story of a bunch of, uh, as uh, Barley puts it, uh, I mean, Barclay puts it, a uh, bunch of rascals. I mean, there's a lot of rascals in the story, uh, yet these rascals are actually teaching the sons of light something. You need to be shrewd in the sense that you need to put investments in the right places and you need to understand certain things. And he's going to bring out a specific thing here in a moment. Um, actually, right now, verse 9, he says, And I say to you, make friends of yourselves by me means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. So that's the more precise interpretation of this story and what he's really trying to uh, teach his disciples. What he's saying is, is that you need to make friends of this unrighteous uh, or wealth of unrighteousness. In the original language, it would be the unrighteous mammon. Okay. Uh, mammon just meaning wealth. Unrighteous in the sense that it's unreliable and untrustworthy and uncertain. Uh, that's kind of what an unrighteous uh, person might be. A person who doesn't deal with people in the right way. Uh, they're shady. You can't trust them. They're uncertain. Uh, that's how Jesus relates or how Jesus describes money. It's also described that way in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 by the Apostle Paul when he's telling Timothy how to instruct the people, the rich people there at Ephesus, how to deal with their money or how to view their money. He says in verse 17, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, 
but on God. And this money that we have in this life is uncertain, unreliable, untrustworthy. Now, the, Ameri the American dollar could lose its value like that. Uh, look what happened back during the Depression with the stock market. Uh, one minute we might be wealthy, the next minute our money may not be worth the paper it's printed on. You just can't trust in wealth. So you want to use your wealth and your money to make friends and to build relationships. That's the more valuable thing. That's the more lasting thing. And that's what he contrasts here. You have the, the wealth of unrighteousness, that which is uncertain, unreliable, but when it fails, or the King James would say, when ye fails, or when you fail, in other words, when you die, which would happen at the same time, right? The money will fail when you fail. Your money will fail when you die. You can't take it with you. As soon as you die, if you have a million dollars in the bank, the money fails for you because you can't take it with you, right? So he's talking about here in death. When it fails, when you fail physically, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. The idea here is that when you're generous with your money, when you're compassionate with your money, when you're gracious with your money, when you're open-handed with your money, you're building up relationships that will last eternally. Whereas if you're closed-fisted and you're holding on to your money and you're greedy and you don't want to let go of your money, yeah, you might have money for this short time, but eventually it's going to fail because it, it doesn't really hold water. It's, it's, it's not valuable. You want to invest your money. You want to be shrewd in the sense that you're investing your money in the right places, building the right relationships. And when you do that, God will bless you into the eternal dwellings and you'll have an immense amount of people there to receive you and to welcome you into these eternal dwellings. So that's where your investment should rise. If you're going to be as shrewd as the people of the world in spiritual things, that's what you're going to do. It continues on in verse 10. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So here he says, he basically calls money a little thing. Um, and, and this reveals a little bit of how God uses money in our lives. It's, it's, even, it's, it's as though God puts money into our lives really to test us, to see how faithful we'll be. Brings money into our lives to see where our hearts really lay. Um, if, he, if He blesses us with money... Our true heart will be revealed by the way that we receive that money and what we do with that money. If we hold on to it and, and we don't want to let it go, then that reveals in our heart greediness and covetousness. But if he gives us that money and we are open-handed with it, we're generous, we're compassionate, we exhibit love to people with that money, then that reveals in our heart that our heart is full of love and care for other people. And so God can bring money into our lives, the little thing, so that he can test us, so that when he gives us the eternal things, that the, the thing that really will last, the treasures that really will last for eternity, he can rightly do so because we've been faithful with the, the, the uncertain riches that we have today. And, and he says that, therefore, if you have been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, in other words, if you handled this money that's uncertain, that's, you know, temporary, not lasting. Um, if you haven't been faithful in that, uh, you know, who, how will he give you more than that? The other thing that he says is that this money actually belongs to God, right? He gives it to us. We are kind of like a steward. He gives us the money and we are to watch over it and to use it wisely. But he says, you know, if you can't even take care of that which is another's, that is, we take care of that which is God's, who he just gives to you and entrusts to you, how is it that God would then give you riches of your own that you can actually own in eternity and actually be yours? Verse 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And, and this is generally true. I mean, you, you can't be totally and absolutely and completely devoted to one master 
if you've got another master who might be giving you conflicting instructions to your other master. There's a conflict of interest that occurs when you have two masters. Well, wealth is oftentimes in stark contrast to the commands of God. If your master is money, what is your master, what is the master mammon going to ask of you? Give me all your time, give me all your energy, give me all your resources, pour your whole self into me in making money, acquiring money, building up your own kingdom, acquiring great possessions. That's what that master demands. But God, who is the other master, is going to demand of you generosity and care for people and being very generous with your money and being willing to give up your money and maybe even to become poor for the sake of other people in some instances. And so you can't serve both. You're either going to live for money or you're going to live for God. You can't have it both ways. And sadly, a lot of uh, Christians would want it both ways. I'm going to live my whole life just acquiring a bunch of money, but at the same time, I want a relationship with God and I'm going to turn my nose away from uh, people who are needy and people who could actually benefit from the wealth that I have. Can't have it both ways. We have to decide which one takes the upper hand. Which one are we going to serve more? God or serve money? So in just these three verses, we learn a lot about money, how God views money, right? Uh, we could go back and see that he sees money as uncertain, un unreliable, unrighteous. We could see that God sees money as a very little thing, whereas the, us in our society, we think money is a big thing. It's what life is all about, but in God's eyes, it's a very little thing. God sees money as really belonging to himself and just loaned out to us for, for a little time. When we realize that, we can be a lot more generous. If I realize that all the money that I have in my bank account, however much that might be, is really God's and it doesn't really belong to me, it's just entrusted to me for a little while, I can be more generous with it. But if I take, if I take it as being mine and what I earn and my right to have, I'm going to be a lot more stingy with it. But God sees that as, hey, the whole universe, the whole cosmos belongs to God, including the money. And if we have money, it's only lent to us by God for a short amount of time. So God views money as really belonging to him. And then we can see money also, God can see money or views money as a person's master if they submit themselves to him. Uh, a very harsh master, but a master nonetheless. Well, now let's see how these Pharisees respond to Jesus' teachings. The Pharisees, they were all about money. Matter of fact, they felt that the more wealthy they were, the more spiritual they would appear to other people. They equated uh, wealth with spirituality. How wealthy I am is proof of how much God approves of my life and how much God has blessed me. And so let's see how they respond. Verse 14, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. That word for scoffing literally means they turned up their nose at him. Uh, the original language, that's what that word means. So literally they were turning up their noses at Jesus. And you can almost picture these guys in their eloquent uh, clothing, you know, with their noses turned up, looking at Jesus, scoffing him for this message that he's giving about money. Well, Jesus is going to address them in verse 15. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. But God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. So you are the, the type of people who justify yourselves. You think that you're justified in uh, taking advantage of people, uh, robbing widows' houses, as he talks about in Matthew chapter 23, taking advantage of the poor, mistreating people, uh, despising the poor, thinking that, oh, they're just poor because they're sinners. Uh, you justify yourselves in acquiring all this wealth and, and thinking that you're okay in doing so. He says, but God knows your heart. He knows where your heart lays. He knows who your master truly is. And with the Pharisees, uh, there was a sense in which their master was mammon. It was wealth. He says, for that which is highly esteemed among men is this detestable in the sight of God. Uh, that is, if you're just putting on a show, if you're just putting on a, a facade, and people are looking up to you, and that's all that you're living for, that, that's the, uh, dete uh, detestable in the sight of God. In verse 16, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached. 
and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. So he says the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, that's the New American Standard translators, uh, kind of supplying us with some words that make it a little bit more understandable. But literally in the original language, it would read the law and the prophets until John. So some translators would say the law and the prophets were until John. The American Standard is saying were proclaimed until John to help understand what Jesus would later say about how the law was not going to fail. But nonetheless, the idea here is that the law and the prophets is what it was all about before John the Baptist came. That was what they were to adhere to. That's what they were to listen to. The people who taught, they taught from the law and the prophets. But now something new is happening. John the Baptist came preaching the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And now this new for lack of a better term, this new world order was going to be ushered in. And it was going to be a kingdom like they had never seen before. A heavenly kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. And he says everyone is forcing their way into it. They're, they're, everyone is pressing into this new thing that, it, that has been pronounced by John the Baptist and continued to be pronounced by Jesus himself. But he says, but it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. And that's understandable when you think about the fact that all of the law and the prophets, the purpose of the law and the prophets, were to bring people to Christ and to bring them into the kingdom of God uh, eventually. That's what Paul tells the Galatians who were very intent on keeping <coughs> circumcision and keeping the law of Moses. He said, look, the purpose of the law of Moses was to bring people to Christ and the new things that have come through Christ. So it's not as though... The, the law had failed or that God had said, you know what, that law is not good. Let's crumble it up and throw it away. No, the fulfillment of the law had come through this kingdom of heaven. So you can see it as the law has come to its full fruition. It come to its full end, its full telos uh, in Christ. And therefore, it's not going to fail. It's actually going to be fulfilled. And, he, and then he gets into divorce. He says in verse 18, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who commits one, I'm sorry, who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. Now this seems like a peculiar commandment to place in this particular location because you have Jesus talking about wealth and then he gets into the Pharisees and their situation. He's talking about the law and the kingdom. And then even after this, in the context Starting in verse 19, we're going to see the rich man, Lazarus. He's talking about wealth. This whole chapter is basically about money and wealth. But inserted in here is this commandment about not divorcing your wife. Uh, and, and a very stern word for that matter. He says, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. He likens divorce to adultery. Uh, and he even says, uh, he who marries one who is divorced, the person who has been divorced before, and marries. It's like adultery. So what is going on here? Why is this even brought into this context? Well, it's got to be somehow tied to these Pharisees, right? Because that's what brought this whole thing on. The Pharisees, so there was two school of thoughts uh, when it came to the Jewish uh, religion back then. Uh, you had this school of thought that said, you know what, the only, way you, the only reason you can divorce a woman is for sexual immorality. The, the book of Deuteronomy gives permission to write a certificate of divorce. Uh, it was for the benefit of the wife so that she wouldn't be basically financially crushed uh, going through a divorce. So God said, you know what, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to write this certificate of divorce. But there was a lot of debate on what was the means of that. Uh, the law says, if you see anything unclean in her, well, what, what does that mean? Well, some people say it had to be sexual immorality. It had to be that uh, she somehow committed some type of sexual act that, allow, that would allow you then to divorce her. But then there were others who were more liberal with this verse, and they would say, you know, if she burnt the toast, if she, uh, if she there was one who would say, that if she, if she was so contentious, if she lifted her voice to the point that the neighbor could hear, that was grounds for divorce. Um, bas basically, any reason you could divorce your wife. So some had taken this as liberty to say, well, I don't want to commit adultery, but I, but I sure do like 
that, that pretty girl over there, that young woman over there. But I don't want to commit adultery. No, that would be wrong. How can I have this woman, but at the same time not be in violation of the law? Well, let me divorce my <coughs> wife and then marry this woman, and then I will have her, and I'm not committing adultery because I'm married to her, and I'm not married to my former wife. The other thing that might be going on, and, and is more, uh, in, uh, more in line with the context here, is divorcing and marrying for the sake of acquiring money. So you might have married a poor woman, he took her into your home, but maybe as time goes on, you become more successful. And then the opportunity arises for you to marry another woman who's from a very wealthy and influential family. And so you divorce your old wife to acquire that wife in order to have access to the wealth and, and things that her family could bring in. And so you could use it to acquire money as well. And, and perhaps that's what Jesus is hitting on here. But either way, he's saying you guys are abusing the law and abusing this whole idea of divorce. And he's, and he's driving a hard line here. He says, if you're doing that, you, are, you think you're avoiding adultery, but you're actually committing adultery because you're trying to work your way around the law to get what you really want, but you're really just, in the end, committing adultery. And so here, Jesus is really showing us, you know, what is truly valuable in life and, and what we should be chasing after and how the Pharisees had got it wrong. Now we're going to get into one of the most famous parables by Jesus called the rich man and Lazarus. And we're going to see uh, how this plays out. Uh, I don't want to give away too much, but Lazarus, Lazarus is really just a Latin version of the original name, which was Eleazar, which means uh, whom the Lord helps or whom God helps. Um, it's very interesting. Some would see this as not a parable at all that this is actually a story because parables don't typically have names. So the fact that Lazarus was given a name, this might have been an actual historical event. But either way, the principles that are drawn from it are the same. It says in verse 19, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. So, big contrast between these two people. One man is living it up in, in luxury, in the lap of luxury. Uh, he's wearing these fine garments. He's eating the fine food. Uh, he can eat whatever he wants. He can do whatever he wants. He's got wealth. He's got affluence. He's just really living it up. And then you got Lazarus, who's at his gate. He's covered with sores. Reminds you a little bit of Job. But he's at the gate, and he's covered with sores. Dogs are coming and licking the sores. And in, in, in Jewish society, that would have been a very horrible thing because dogs were seen as very unclean, especially uh, the type of dogs that would kind of just rummage through trash and stuff. They were very unclean. But the dogs are coming and licking his sores. Uh, he, not only would he like uh, a number two from Waterburger, but that, that, that would be too much. He just wants crumbs. Just give me some, some type of crumbs to eat. Uh, that would be enough. And so th these two guys are contrasted. It says in verse 22, Now the, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes and being in torment and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. So now everything has shifted. Now Lazarus is in the lap of luxury, or we could say in the bosom of Abraham, as Jesus says, and he's enjoying the fruits of, of, uh, of the blessings of God. And now the rich man is in torment. And he's just dying of thirst. Uh, and where Lazarus would have just loved to have a breadcrumb from the rich man's table before, now the rich man would just love just to have a drop of water from Lazarus. And um, says, and that's what he says. He says, he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue for I'm in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember, 
that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great uh, chasm fixed. And so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. And so he's, at, he's begging, Father Abraham, just let Lazarus give me a little bit of water to cool my tongue. He's in torment. And Abraham calls him out. He says, hey, you had it good while you were living. Now he has it good, now that you've both died. And, and he mentions how the, the situation has switched. And then he says that there's this big chasm between the two of them and, and that they couldn't cross over. So apparently it wasn't even, quote unquote, physically possible for him to give him this water. But nonetheless, he can't receive any water now. So the question is, is why did the rich man end up in torment? It wasn't something that he did necessarily, right? It doesn't say that Lazarus was at the gate and every morning when the rich man went off to work, he kicked him or you know, punched him in the face or did anything ugly to him. What did he do? He didn't really do anything, it's what he didn't do. He ignored Lazarus day after day after day. Probably passed him every day, saw how miserable he was feeling, saw what a bad situation he was in, and didn't even consider to help him. This is very convicting because oftentimes we think, well, we're okay as long as we're not doing bad things towards other people. As long as I'm not hurting anybody, everything is okay. But what this parable reveals is that maybe we'll even be held accountable for what we don't do, for holding back and not helping our neighbor, not going out and seeing the needs that are there and not fulfilling those needs. Turning our noses to suffering in this world. Um, it might just be that perhaps we're okay as far as not treating people in a bad way, but we may not be doing so well when it comes to treating people in a good way and actually seeking opportunities to help people. But, but this is why he's in torment, or at least part of the reason why he's in torment. And it's a permanent state. There, there is no change that can take place once he's there. In verse 27, and he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. So he has these five brothers. Once he's there, he's like, I don't, I don't want them to have to experience what I'm going through. And maybe they were living the same life that he was. Maybe they were from a wealthy family, received a big inheritance, and they were doing the same things that he was. And now he wants uh, someone to be sent, to warn them about this. Uh, send Lazarus to warn them. Uh, and then verse 29, But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. So he says, you know what, send them to go see, uh, or to warn my brothers. But uh, Abraham tells him, no, you know, they have the law and the prophets. They've been taught what the right thing to do. They should know about generosity. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself is there in the law of Moses. They should know to be generous to other people. Um, that's sufficient. Having the word of God is sufficient. But he says, no, he's persistent. But if someone goes from the dead, surely if someone is risen from the dead, people will repent, right? And eerily, or in a very eerie way, we have these words, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Who does that sound like? Jesus. Jesus would be risen from the dead. But even though it had Moses and the law and the prophets that were testifying to the fact that he would be risen from the dead, he himself predicted that he would be risen from the dead. And he would, be, he would rise from the dead and he would actually go out and teach. He hung around for some 40 days teaching and, and revealing himself to people. But that wasn't enough. Because their ears were closed to the law and the Moses, uh, law, uh, of Moses and the law, 
They couldn't see even though Jesus had risen from the dead. And they didn't repent of the fact that they had crucified the very Messiah that they had been looking for. So this shows us that, you know, while we're in this world, while we're out and about, you know, we're all alive and we're kind of embedded in society and we have certain ideas and standards that are placed on us and what's important, what's valuable. One man got to see torment. He got to see what it meant to be in torment based upon the life that he lived. And you know what? For that man, wealth didn't mean anything. He didn't, go, he didn't ask that Lazarus go back to his brothers to teach them more financial truths to help them to know. Don't let them come to this place of torment. That was his main concern. And I don't think we really realize just what it's going to be like. A lot of the imagery when it comes to uh, eternal judgment and things, yes, it's used metaphor and uses uh, you know, descriptive language. All that aside, we just know it's not going to be pleasant. And it's not going to be fun for those who uh, don't come to Christ. And that should be our main driving force. Not acquiring a lot of money, not acquiring a lot of wealth for ourselves, but putting Christ first and helping other people to come to find Christ. Now is the day that we can teach people and we can go to them and we can uh, turn them in the way of the truth. Once we die, it'll be too late. That's what uh, the rich man learned the hard way. Now is the time to bring people into the kingdom so that they can enjoy the blessings of paradise and enjoy the blessings of eternal life. To then have the eternal riches that aren't unrighteous, that aren't uncertain, but are certain and eternal. That's what we want to bring people into. And that's what we ourselves want to enter into as well. So as we close chapter 16, we're left with a decision. What master will we follow? The master who will give us pleasure today, give us comfort today, might make us happy today, or the master who can give us eternal habitations, can receive us into eternal habitations, who can bless us with eternal riches that will last forever and ever and ever. As uh, the song we sang, Amazing Grace, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years it'll be like we just began when we enjoy the riches that god gives us uh no matter how long we've been there we have that much longer to go and even so much more it'll be for eternity so that's the better master to follow that's the better investment that's the shrewd decision to make to invest in eternal reward not so much in the temporary reward that we get in this world so as we close the lesson this morning i would encourage anyone who's considering should I follow Christ or should I consider to follow uh, the ways of the world? Well, I would just ask you, which one is the better investment? Which one is the more wise decision? Which one will give you the better return? Yeah, it might be a big cost to follow Christ in this world. It might cost you your life. Who knows? But the return is wonderful. Uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, he says, but the, these uh, temporary or momentary light afflictions cannot compare to the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. And so that is the better investment. I'd encourage anyone either who's listening online or is here uh, this morning to make that investment. Give your life to Christ. Commit yourself to Him and allow yourself to be that wise and shrewd servant who is looking for the